morning, so it's now uh, 15 past, and then we are starting the, the machine learning coffee seminar on, on Zoom, so good morning and welcome everyone. Uh, so, so again, as, as before, so please keep your uh, microphones muted, but, but Eric also said that you are uh, able to, to ask questions already during the presentation. So when you would like to do that, please just uh, push the raised hand button that you can find from the bottom of the participant list, and I, I will then give you the, the floor to ask the questions. But as I uh, said, so today we have Erik Harkonen from Aalto University, who is going to talk to us. Good morning and welcome. And he will be talking about discovering interpretable uh, GAN controls. So please, the floor is yours. Go right, ahead. thank you. Thank you very much. Nope, sorry about that. Okay, thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Erik Harkonen and I'm from Jaakko Lehtinen's research group from Aalto University. And this is a project that I started uh, last year. I did an internship at Adobe Research. So this is a collaboration between Adobe Research and then uh, me and Jaakko from Aalto. And this, this is simultaneously a paper that's currently under review and also my master's thesis. And like, uh, like Laura said, please ask any ask questions during the presentation if you have any any burning questions in mind. So we're we're working with with generative models here. So these have been widely successful and popular recently. And the idea is that we have some kind of input data distribution, uh, so training examples, and then we have a generative model that generates novel data that looks like it comes from the from the training distribution. And on the, on the top here, we see the evolution of generative adversarial networks. So we can see just an explosion in, in image quality recently. And generative models, not only GANs, but also variational autoencoders and flow models and other autoregressive models have, have been really popular recently. Um, but one problem is that even though the image quality has, has increased drastically, the interpretability and editability of these models has not is increased at the same pace. So there's still lots of open questions about how do we get fine-grained control over the outputs of these models. And that would really make them usable in image editing applications and stock photography and what have you. So that's why we're interested in, in looking at how to, how to actually interact with these models better. And we're specifically working with generative adversarial networks here, or so-called GANs. And and here we have an example of a GAN that's trained to create pictures of dogs. So we have the generator block on the left, which takes in just a random noise vector and then generates an image that looks like it comes from the, from the training distribution. And then we have another network, the discriminator, whose task is to distinguish between fake or real images of dogs. And then these two networks compete and improve together and over the course of the training process, the, the image quality approaches, the image quality improves and also the kind of the variability and the, the distribution approaches the original training distribution up to a point. So in general, uh, these GANs and also other um, generative models, they have an input latent space, which is where we draw these random, random noise vectors from. And, and the latent space is typically an isotropic Gaussian distribution. So that means that the, the shape of the input distribution doesn't really tell us anything useful about, about the model itself. It just looks equally stretched in all directions. And then here we see two different points in this, in this latent space that generate two different looking images. Here we have, for example, a, a GAN that generates barns. So the input space is not informative and the output space is very complex in, in pixel space and certainly not isotropic anymore. <clears throat> um, and then if we, if we, it is possible to identify directions in this latent space where we actually perform some very specific um, generation of images, whereas we can, for example, generate the same image but in a slightly different context or with different colors or you know, somehow, somewhat, somehow modified um, in some meaningful way. So we're really interested in how to find these directions in this input lane space that generate some useful changes to the output image. And often uh, finding these directions is quite difficult. So that's, that's really what we're interested in here. 
So some previous previous methods have have discovered these changes in a supervised way. So on the left here we have we have so-called uh, or we have um, a method that labels a small part of the training data. So this is this is kind of a, a change that affects the training phase already. So here basically we're saying, um, hey model, please learn these different things. We find expression and head rotation and, and glasses. We find these things to be important. So we you know, give this data to the generator during the training phase. Hey, please learn these things. And then on the other hand, we have these uh, a posteriori methods where we have a, already an existing GAN that's been trained. And then we try to uh, look at the generator and ask the question, hey model, have you perhaps learned about Zoom? Have you perhaps learned about expression and eyeglasses and so forth? And these use uh, hand-specified pixel space target transformations for the, for the top one or existing attribute detector networks that kind of can, can label an image as old or young or you know, something else like smiling, sad, some other attributes. So here we're really relying on existing models to label our data. And all of these methods, they're, they're limiting in the sense that we, uh, we must have an existing target transformation or, or an existing um, classifier or attribute detector network or, you know, we're also limited by our own imagination. We have, since we're asking questions uh, kind of in the, in the form of, have you learned this, have you learned that, we kind of have to come up with these possible uh, important changes our, on, our, on our own. Uh, but what, this, what our project is really interested in is instead asking the question, hey model, Please show me everything that you've learned. Please show me what you consider to be important. So we're interested in unsupervised discovery of, of interpretable edits. So we, we take in an existing pre-trained GAN, meaning we don't have to perform the very expensive and often uh, unstable training process. Um, and then as another contribution, we also show that we can modify big GAN, which is an existing state-of-the-art GAN architecture too to perform style edits in the, in the style, in, in the same way that StyleGAN can. These are two uh, state-of-the-art network architectures that we'll go through shortly. So here's just a small teaser of the kinds of things where you can, you can identify. So you can, in the, in the case of faces, you can change the expression and you can kind of morph the face in different ways. So enlarge the jaw in this case. And then there's also changes in, in lighting and, and shading and colors that can be found uh, and also some more specific aspects like the lipstick uh, on, on, the, on the image and, and so forth. So uh, Big GAN is one of the network architectures that we're working with. So here we, again, we have the input latent space Z and the, this random uh, noise vector is that's drawn from Z is fed into not only the first layer of the generator, but also all the subsequent layers as, as can be seen by these black arrows at the bottom. And, and then you know, up with a series of, of transpose convolution operators, we, operations, we, we transform this abstract input space into, into an output image. And style GAN is similar, where we have a, an input lane space, and then, uh, we have, then we have a transformation block called the mapping network, which is, this, it differs from big GAN in the sense that there's a mapping from the input lane space Z into another uh, intermediate lane space W, which is, the cloud at the bottom at the bottom of the of the figure there and then this intermediate latent vector is again fed into every layer of the generator so really crucial here is the fact that the latent vector is not only fed into the first layer but also all the subsequent layers and uh, this project like like we concluded before the input lane space is isotropic and not informative and the output space is highly complex and hard to reason about so what we're really interested in is is looking at the intermediate layers in between because somewhere in, somewhere in the in the internals of the network we're going from an isotropic distribution to something very interesting so can we somehow find these interesting directions of change at the intermediate layers of the generator so very concretely the the layers that we're analyzing in this in this paper or this um, this project is the so-called gen z layer for big gan which is just the first linear layer and also, it's the first non-isotropic layer of the generator. So just the first layer that has some interesting shape uh, on its own. And then in Stargan, we're analyzing the intermediate latent space W directly. And in order to find interesting directions of change, we're using principal component analysis, or PCA. So just as a recap here, uh, in the case of Stargan, uh, 
we draw a bunch of latent vectors z, which are distributed as, according to a Ga isotropic Gaussian. And then we map them to the W latent space with the mapping network M. And then we, gen we generate images by, uh, as a fun with the generator G as a function of W. And now here we're really interested in, in describing the distribution of the W vectors. So concretely, we draw a bunch of Z samples and then map them to the W space. So we have a bunch of W ve vectors, W1 to Wn. And then we simply run PCA on this collection of samples. And we get a new basis uh, with, with basis vectors V1 to D. And here D m it might not necessarily be as, uh, we might have fewer basis vectors in this representation than we have dimensions in the, in the input latent space. So this does not have to be a complete PCA basis. And then given a new W that generates an image that we want to modify somehow, somehow we uh, move along one of these principal component directions and then just apply an offset to W. And that generates a new image that's some, somehow different. So let's take a look at what these uh, basis vectors actually look like. So here we have Stargan 2 generating cars. Um, and we can see that the, the first basis vector, for example, is kind of a rotation of the car or changes the orientation. And then we have you know, other, other large geometric changes among the first few principal components. And then as we go down, uh, we see that the, well, here we still see some large geometric changes. And then in the, in the middle components, we see that the, the orientation and the, and the position doesn't change as drastically. So the, the geometric, uh, change seems to really be explained by the first few components and then you know the further down we drill um, the more localized or nuanced changes we, we get so we get kind of color and shading changes and so forth and this is due, really due to the orthonormality of the PCA basis so because the first the biggest direction of change contains geometry which causes a large change all across the, the network then the next next component cannot contain that same direction of change because they're forced to be orthogonal. So the large changes kind of drop, drop off after the first few components. And it, while these raw principal components are certainly interesting, especially for kind of uh, visualizing what the network is, is doing, uh, they're also quite entangled, meaning you, one, change, one component can change the geometry and the colors and the, and the shape and, and the style of the image in many different entangled ways. So what we're, what we're interested in, in having is what we're interested in is having more disentangled, specific control over different aspects of the image. So one thing we can we can do here, because the latent vector is fed into every intermediate layer of the generator, why not just apply this editing offset on a few of these layers and not globally across the whole network? So it's kind of known from previous research that generative models they build build the the image in a way where, they, where, where the first layers define the overall geometry of the, of the image to be generated, and then the later layers apply shading and colors and, and style in general. So if you want just the geometric part of a certain component, we can apply it to the first few layers. Or if we just want the style component of a style edit of a specific component, we can just apply it at the later, later layers of the generator. And this is a way of forcing more disentanglement in our, in our edits. So here, this video clip demonstrates how how we can narrow down the layer range to get more interesting edits. So for example, this component here seems to change all kinds of aspects. It goes from a sporty car to an average everyday car, but it also changes the background and the, and the shading and so forth. So here we can see that the, the first, the layers, layers zero to three, for example, they just seem to keep more or less the style of the car the same, but just stretch it in different ways. And then the, the intermediate layers here, four to six, they seem to change the, the shape and the background of the car. And then the later layers, they change the lighting conditions. So here, for example, reflections. And, and then we also have color changes at the later layers. So here we can see uh, the color of the car changing, for example, at layers 10 to 15. So now the user might, for example, want this car uh, shape change. So then, then he or she finds the, the range of layers that's appropriate and then exports uh, this edit for later use. And then once we've found a direction, it can be 
uh, applied to, to other samples of the generator as well. So we can draw a new latent vector, generate a new car, and then modify it in the same way. And here also we see an interesting behavior where the sports cars seem to seem to come in these uh, or seem to be photographed in these open spaces, whereas the the other cars are kind of in a, in a forest environment. And then uh, after discovering these edits, we can also apply them, you know, at one after the other sequentially and at the same time. And they kind of work nicely together, and they don't undo the changes of each other, and they they just behave nicely in general. And here's some here's just a collection of interesting edits that that we've discovered in with with our tool. So here you can see some background changes or changes to the eyes of the character here, for example, or the person. Uh, and then you know some quite nuanced facial expression changes that might be hard to discover with with a supervised methods or or like the our eyebrow angle might be very difficult to kind of label in a data set by hand and one interesting aspect is the fact that the, the generator seems to have some conditional behavior built in. So for example, uh, the lipstick direction that we saw previously, uh, it, it refuses to apply onto a male looking face. And then also if we have a beard direction, it, it just does not apply in any meaningful way to a female looking face. So there's some interesting conditional behavior in the generator as well. That's really, it's worth uh, investigating further in another, in another project perhaps. And then also here's another data set of, of cars. We, kind of, we saw some cars before and we find some shape morphing and then just color changes at the later layers of the generator. And then, um, yeah, some more uh, style changes. And then we can also change the background or the environment here. For example, we can add or remove the grass on the ground or change the, the reflections on, on the hood of the car. And here's another example for Stagan 1. This is uh, um, the WikiArt faces data set, which is a data set of paintings. And especially for these kind of artistic data sets, there's lots of interesting uh, directions to be found that, that change between different artistic styles and kind of change the stroke, char stroke characteristics and also some geometric stuff. So this is, this is really an interesting tool to kind of discover these style edits in, in different data sets. Right, so uh, an observation about this edit is, is the fact that um, the, at the early layers, the generator seems to decide the, the ab a more abstract geometry, geometry of, of the output image. So if we want to find changes to the geometry of the image, uh, it makes sense to apply these changes to the early layers of the generator. That in that way, we don't get any extra style changes uh, accidentally in our edit that you, would happen at the later layers. And then in, symmetrically, the first few principal components seem to contain large geometric changes. So if we're looking, if we're really looking for a geometric edit, it makes sense to also search among the first few principal components. And then the other way around, if, we, if we're interested in performing a style edit, it makes sense to search among the, the later principal components where the geometry has already been factored out and then apply that to the later layers of the generator. So that's all well and good, and it works nicely for Stagan. Uh, but in Big Gan, we have a problem, and that is that uh, we cannot perform PCA on the input latent space Z directly because it's isotropic in shape. So we have to perform PCA at the first intermediate layer of the generator. And now, once we find these, these directions at this layer, we can apply them, and, and the change kind of propagates forward to the intermediate layers. But now, we're not performing the corresponding change to these skip Z connections that are, that are given to every uh, layer of the generator. So now we have a mismatch between the latent vector that is fed to every layer and then the actual you know, abstract representation that propagates forward. And this also means that we cannot really perform um, the edit at a specific uh, range of layers anymore because we can't we don't have the latent vectors that we can apply to just like the third, fourth, and fifth layer, for example. We, we have no choice but to perform global edits. So we solve this problem by first performing a linear regression step from the, the intermediate layer back to the latent space. So this means that we find 
the directions in Z that correspond to the principal components that were discovered at the first uh, linear layer of the of Big GAN. And once we have these uh, components in Z, we can now you know, go back and apply them to a certain range of layers that we're interested in. And in this way, we get the same granularity of control uh, over the generation as we had with StarGAN. And here's just an illustration of, of what that what that's doing. So we have the input lane space and that it's not isotropic in shape, not informative. And then the first intermediate layer has already shaped this, this distribution in some interesting way. And so PCA discovers principal components, so the, the directions that explain the most variance on, on this intermediate layer. So we find, for example, V, which might be the first principal component. And then we have a color coding, which signifies the coordinate along this principal component. And then the regression step goes back to Z. And now we can see that we have another principal compo another direction U, which kind of explains the same variance, but in, in the latent space. So we perform PCA at the first non-isotropic layer, and then we do a regression. And then also by, by applying the edit only to uh, certain layers, we, we get more control over the style. So here on the left, we see kind of a, an image grid uh, of, of a husky dog generated by big GAN, but in different styles. So what I'm here somewhat jokingly calling big style GAN, it's just an observation that we can get style GAN-like uh, style behavior in big GAN by kind of putting the network into impossible configurations. So here uh, we have a, one latent vector Z1, which generates the geometry in, a, in, the, in the abstract representation on the first couple of layers. Uh, so, so the Z1 really defines the, the position of the dog and the shape of the dog, but doesn't really, it's not considered, it's not concerned with the background and the color and so forth. And then we just switch to another latent vector starting at the third layer. And then we, this, this second latent vector controls the style of the, of the image. So now we can perform style resampling in big GAN by just kind of freezing the activations at a certain intermediate layer by just using one latent vector for the first couple of layers and then switching and using another one and getting style mixing behavior here. And this, is, this behavior has not really been demonstrated in, in any other research paper. So it's also one, one of our contributions. And here we see a grid of, of style mixing. So this is, this is emulating one figure in the, in the original Stagan paper where we have the style images in the top row, which kind of define the, the colors and, and the style of the image. And then we have a content image in the leftmost column, which defines the geometry of the image. And then we can see that by performing this style mixing at, at different depths of the generator, so starting at layer one, three, or five, we can control the amount of, uh, of geometric consistency with the, with the input content image. So if we, if we swap too early, some of the geometry from the style image gets to bleed into the, into the final output image. But if we swap too late, then uh, we might resemble the, the content image too much. So there's a trade-off here to be, to be had. So here's just a collection of edits that can be discovered in Big GAN at the first intermediate layer. So there's some geometric changes, but then there's also very interesting edits such as adding pixelation to the image. And then there's some, some general like style changes such as changing the time of day here. We can see the, the, the sky change in color, or we can add clouds to, to an image of a, of a lighthouse. And then we can change the, the color temperature and, and other aspects. So these are all generated by big GAN, but it's a, it's a conditional GAN. So you can, by changing the, the class conditioning information, we can generate images from different classes. And also, like we saw before, there's some pixel space effects such as the blurriness and the, and the sharpness and the contrast and so forth. And also geometric changes at the first layer. So stretching the neck of the owl, for example, and, and so forth. Uh, one interesting observation that's not, not it's not, it wasn't first observed by us, but rather you know, found by other researchers is the fact that if we, if we take a latent vector and then we generate an image and then we change the class conditioning information but use the same latent vector and the same random seed, we essentially get a new image with the same geometric properties. So if we change the, the type of animal, it stays in the same orientation, but then just the, you know, the, the, the class changes and, and the background also changes somewhat. And we've also 
kind of seen the same behavior in our project where uh, the first layer, so the Gen Z layer, the, the first uh, linear layer of big GAN seems to be ignoring class information entirely. So that just means that regardless of the class conditioning information, we find the same PCA basis at the first layer. And by extension, that also means that edits transfer between classes because the PCA finds the, the very same basis vectors regardless of the class information. One thing to note though is that even though the same uh, vectors are applicable between image classes, the pixel space effect that these edits have might not be the same. So if we have one direction that makes the image darker, depending on the class, it might just uh, become a, a nighttime image or it might, might become a winter landscape or something like that. So the pixel space effects are not always obvious, but the directions themselves are, are the same regardless of class information. So to summarize, uh, this is, this is a project of, that can, that's concerned with unsupervised discovery of edits. So we want to take an existing pre-trained generator. We don't want to go through the laborious process of labeling training data. We don't want to rely on, a, on an existing attribute detector. And we don't want to be limited by our own imagination even. We just want the network to show us what it considers to be important directions of change. And then by performing layer-wise application of these principal components, we can get much more disentanglement in our edits, which means we can perform some very specific changes to the edit. And then PCA gives us a natural ordering of the edits from large geometric changes to finer style changes. So PCA is really just a, a space where it's easy to look for these edits. But I want to point out that, that the, this method is not incompatible with, with supervised edits that have been discovered by supervised control or even random directions could be potentially applied together with this layer-wise application to get some more disentangled edits. Uh, on, in the image. And then also the, our method is, is based on very, very basic and, and well-studied building blocks uh, such as linear regression and PCA and is also easy to implement. And we have a code base available online for anyone who wants to play around. And there's certainly many interesting future directions. So for example, here we perform PCA at the intermediate layers on the whole so-called activation volume of that intermediate layer. But perhaps it would be interesting to perform PCA on just one spatial position in isolation. So consider every spatial position at the intermediate layer as a separate sample or perform PCA in some other geometric conf configuration on, on the activation volumes. Or perhaps also study running PCA on later layers of the generator. So here we're running PCA on the first layer just for efficiency reasons, but also because the, the directions seem to be of high quality. But perhaps at some later layer, there might be some other kinds of edits to be discovered. So that's, that's all for me. And I thank you for, for the opportunity to, to present this, this paper and, and I hope you have some questions. So thank you very much. So, so do we have questions from the audience or? Not yet, so maybe I can then start. So, so uh, even when we were showing the um, examples where you, for example, tuned the car and so on, so, so the background also changed quite a lot. So, so was that something that was done in purpose or is it still really difficult to restrict the, the changes in, in the certain areas that you want to tune? And if, if it's so, so what should you be doing for, for then kind of like improving that part? Right, so... Um... Yes, it's, it's not, the background and the foreground are not perfectly disentangled. And in fact, just the notion of background and foreground is a bit fuzzy for, you know, for, for some classes like faces, it's obvious that we have a foreground and a background. But then if we're generating dogs that are running around outside, it's hard to kind of distinguish between background and foreground. But you're, you're right, the fact that the background also changes with some of these edits is, um, you know, it's, it's something that we cannot perfectly remove at least with the existing network architectures. So perhaps um, some other gener generator architecture might help here, or then just maybe there's some other way to perform edits that is even more disentangled. So this is hopefully some, something down, down the line would give us even better edits, but this is kind of the first stepping stone. Yeah, and it was very impressive, so yeah. yeah okay, thank you. So other questions do we have from the audience? No, 
So I'm again not yeah. able to raise my hand. So if there are no yeah. other oh, hands, yeah, maybe yeah. I can go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, so if I understand correctly, this is you are essentially you are linearizing. I mean that's what the PCA does. You are linearizing the mapping at at a certain level, and then you do that sequentially so that you can do the disentanglement. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. But but the, of course the uh, because the whole network is nonlinear. Uh, then the linearization is only capturing some of the variation, and that's of course the key idea there. But yeah, that, this raises the question that if, if you want to have certain kinds of effects, could you do them at a specific location? I, this is ties to, ties to what Laura was asking. So, so if you could, for instance, take the background and linearize the effects in the background, then you could have controls for the background specifically. It's, it's just a thought, so you may have thought about this. You could contextualize also the linearization with some other variables than, than the foreground background. background. Yeah. I, I can't, maybe I don't have a good handle on what those could be, but yeah, in principle you could do those. Of course, then the interface becomes more complicated, right? Then you don't just have one set of controls, but the controls are context sensitive. But then yeah. another other thought is, is that the, uh, for the disentanglement, so PCA, of course, it, it does, it, it just linearizes, it does nothing else, right? But then something like the independent component analysis might be looking for really independent, in, in that sense, disentangled works. I, I believe that Arpo Hyvärinen has been writing something about the kind of deep, deep uh, independent component analysis deep learning and independent component analysis combined, which might come in handy. I, but I, I don't know the details and whether they would match here. Just giving a couple of my five cents worth. Yeah, yeah, those are great ideas. So I can comment. Um, first, like um, if, we're, if we're performing edits in Z, uh, by default in, in big GAN and star GAN, these changes will apply globally across the whole network. But perhaps by, uh, by changing the architecture in a way where the, the skip connections that are applied to every layer. If those were, if we could specify one uh, one latent vector per spatial location, then we could certainly perform changes that only affect certain spatial regions of the image. Uh, so that's something that that would certainly be possible and, and it's worth worth researching. And I, I believe there's also been some few some recent work where there's some where, where, for example, the class conditioning information is applied per spatial position. So this would kind of be in the same direction there. And then as for, as for ICA or, or others, uh, we actually did some initial experiments with sparse PCA and ICA, and we couldn't find any, any immediate uh, breakthroughs, but, but it's certainly something that we have not disregarded. And also there's potentially other kinds of like non-negative matrix factorization and, and other kinds of factorization methods that could potentially be useful here. Okay, great. So, so are there some other questions still? I, uh, I, if I may, I just wanted to Please. add a yeah. point of point of clarification to Sami. The um, uh, the linearization is uh, is slightly more complex than I think what you said. The even if you apply these <clears throat> these offsets uh, across multiple layers of the model. You still there's a there's a feed forward structure that you know the model runs and then you then you push the activations along a certain uh, into a certain way by by editing the uh, editing the W or or Z inputs to a given uh, given layer, but then all the subsequent processing still happens with all the nonlinearities uh, in there. So the the linear edits at earlier layers have highly nonlinear effects. On the later layers, and so it's it's sort of a collection of, of of linear edits at various points of the model, but that sort of have this cumulative, highly complex nonlinear uh, nonlinear effect. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I, I I did get that, so that's why I said you linearize at a certain stage, right? Yes, uh, and but multiple... after that it is un, un, uh, nonlinear. But yeah, yeah. So anyway, I, I as okay, I said, I think you. it's a great idea. <laughs> Okay, but it, it seems that there are no, no further questions. So thank you very much, Eric, for that great presentation and everyone for attending. So did you, Sami, want to now say something about the, the next week or 
Uh, okay, yeah, why not? Yeah. So, so we will have one more session this spring, so which is by Jussi Jokin and highly exciting talk, looking forward to that. And then we are thinking of starting a summer break and, and continuing uh, 14th of September, if I remember now, but there, there will be an email about this next week, or yeah. during this week still. Yeah, and then we can also say that the next week, but, but okay, so, so thank you everyone for joining and, and see you then again next week.